Um, as Freya said earlier, and as it is on the screen, don't talk about money. Well, I am going to talk about money, actually. Part two, as I said earlier, if you're back from part one, welcome. I'm glad you're back. And if you're new and visiting, for the record, I don't speak about money every week. Uh, it's been about a year. But, um, you know, we looked at money last week, and I wanted to provide a foundation, foundational teaching on the place of money in our lives and, and how we interact with money because, you know, money has power. I think we all know that. There's a reason it's called purchasing power. Uh, and money itself, we can very easily fall into the bondage of money. And so what I wanted to do last week and, and is look at some foundations around God's view On money, and well, God's view on money can be summed up in Psalm 24, verse 1. Everything is the Lord's. That's the bit when he does the mic drop. You know, we are, as we looked at, not owners of our own money, even though your bank account has your name on it. uh, God owns the money. We are stewards of his money. We then looked at, as we built upon that foundational view, uh, we looked at the warnings and the encouragement that God gives us as his people in the Bible around how we are to deal with money, the blessings that come with it, uh, and the dangers that come with money. Then we looked at the place of tithing as as New Testament believers, and I'd encourage you, uh, if you missed that, to catch up. And then lastly, we looked at um, the blessings that come with giving. And so I want to um, look again at money, and I want to pick out a particular thread um, from last week and look at how that applies to us in our lives. And with that, I'd like us to pray as we carry on. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word brings us life and freedom. Your word is truth, Lord. It is absolute truth. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would open our ears and our hearts to what truth you have for us today. Would you just remove the distractions that we may have and the burdens that we carry? Would we lay at your feet? And Lord God, please, would you help me as I bring your word? Would I only say that which you want me to say? Uh, I pray in your precious name. Amen. You know, there are many indicators uh, in terms of our walk with the Lord. You know, we know that our relationship with Jesus is a journey, isn't it? It is a walk of of growing in maturity, and and money is a very good indicator of our discipleship or our maturity with Christ. You you know, look at your diary and your bank balance, and that will give you some kind of indication of where your priorities are in life. And certainly, tithing and offerings and our whole perspective on money is an indicator, a health indicator, if you like, of our walk with Jesus. But what I want to look at, as I said, is pick up a thread from last week, because what I don't want you to do is come away from last week thinking that tithing is the end game. As if you can check a box and think, I've done my bit, 10%, I'm done. That's not the message. And that's why I want to unpack this particular theme of ownership and stewardship. Because tithing is not saying, I'm going to give to God his 10% and I will keep my 90%. Tithing is there as a gift from God so that we can put money in its place. And as we looked at last week, we can provide for the work of the Lord, provide for others, and in our worship to him. But it's not a tick-the-box exercise. And I, I have lived my Christian life with moments where it becomes a tick-the-box exercise, where I've set up my stand in order, and many of you have done, and it's a great way to do it. But it's almost like it becomes that checkbox exercise. But you see, tithing isn't the end game. It's really the start. It's really the start. And what I'd like us to do to look at the subject of ownership and stewardship is look at a very famous parable that we're going to read together in Luke, and it's chapter 19. And we're going to look at verses 11 to 27. If you're online, it's going to be on your screen. And in the room, it's going to be on the screen here as well. This is a parable of the 10 minors. That's M-I-N-A-S, not minors, as in children. Right, as they heard these things, and we'll look at this in a moment, why, what that means, he proceeded to tell, this is Jesus, a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive himself a kingdom and then return. 
Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 miners and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered those servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your miner has made 10 miners more. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said to him, "Um, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your miner, which I kept laid away In a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not uh, deposit and reap what you did not sow. And so he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man. Well, take him what I did not deposit and repay him what I did not sow. Why then did you not put the money in the bank and at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has 10 miners. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 miners. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. What a parable. I mean, there is so much in it. Have you ever read, the, read, read the, a parable and you're like, well, I, didn't, I don't remember that verse. But as for those enemies of mine who did not want to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Wow. I mean, normally when you remember parables, you remember the fuzzy bits, don't you? We are going to look at that statement near the end because it's an important part and foundational to the message of the gospel, which we'll look at. Now, just some general comments, and then we're going to look at three areas of this parable that applies to us today. The general comments are this. The parable of the ten miners is very similar to the parable of the talents, which we find in Matthew 25, but they're not the same. They are different. Some people assume they're just a a different telling, but they are very different. Uh, And there's enough there for us to warrant a distinction. Very importantly, the, the parable of the talents was actually told later on the Mount of Olives. Okay, that's the, the context for that. The parable of the miners, and this is, we're going to see why this is important, was told on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And this context is very important because it kicks off for me the first thing I want to look at, which is the here and not yet of the kingdom. The here and not yet of the kingdom. You see, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and quite a crowd has been forming. We know if you read the scriptures that he's about to enter Jerusalem with much acclaim and herald as the king. And so what's happening, you see, is this, is this group of, of followers are building up and building up as he approaches Jerusalem. And in their mind, they're thinking, this is the moment. This is the moment that we've been waiting for. Jesus is about to come into Jerusalem. He's about to overthrow the Romans. And he's about to establish the physical kingdom. That is why there was so much triumph on his entry. And so they're on their way. And this is the moment, you can imagine, the moment they've been talking about for for so long that the Messiah was going to come and free them and sit on the throne of David. Now, oftentimes when we look at this as Christians, as New Testament believers, we go, God, God, weren't those Jews silly? Didn't they realize it was coming to establish an altogether different kind of kingdom? (laughs) But I want to point out two things. Number one, the Old Testament is replete of prophecies about the kingdom that Jesus will establish, a physical kingdom. You read through Ezekiel and some of the minor prophets and the Psalms, it talks about a time when Jesus will rule and reign here on earth. The government is going to be placed on his shoulders, remember that? He will rule and reign in Jerusalem. There are so many Old Testament scriptures that point to it. But, and so they thought, well, this must be the time. But Jesus is going to explain to them that this isn't the moment. 
This is the time that he will fulfill the other Old Testament prophecies where he would die on the cross for their sins, being the sacrificial lamb, that he would be pierced for our transgressions. Over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled as Jesus came and died on the cross and was risen again. But here's the thing I don't want us to miss in this. Jesus will come again and he will establish his kingdom. It says in the scriptures that there will be a thousand year reign of Christ. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. And he will fulfill all the prophecies in the Old Testament for, the, for Israel that have yet to be fulfilled. Now there are two views on this. One is called premillennial which means that we believe that we are before the, the literal thousand year reign of Christ. And there are others that have an amillennial view, which is that we are in that time now. The problem, and so what they do is you take the Old Testament prophecies and you spiritualize them and you take it from Israel and say, well, I'll, I'll apply it to me. And yet for somehow we, we leave the curses for Israel. And it doesn't work. I mean, the other issue is during the thousand year rule of reign of Christ, the devil is bound up. In, in the pit. Well, that, why therefore does Paul say that the, the, the devil, or is it Peter, rules, rules around like a roaring lion? And I don't know about you, but this isn't a time of peace. In fact, things are getting worse. I mean, Jesus on the Mount of Olives said, there'll be wars, rumors of wars, there'll be famine. Then they're like labor pains. What happens with labor pains? They get more frequent and intense. And somehow we think that we need to bring in the millennial reign of Christ. No, this is a prophecy that will happen. And I'm going to give you a very brief chronological order because I know you're interested. Thank you. There will be the rapture of the church first. Maranatha means come Lord Jesus. The restrainer will be removed. Who's the restrainer? The Holy Spirit in the church. The restrainer will be removed. And then there will be a covenant with many as we read about in Daniel 9.27 where there will be a seven-year treaty and that will be the time of what's called Jacob's trouble. You can read about that in Daniel. What does that mean? We are currently in the church age. The church goes up to be with Christ for the, for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Can't wait, I'm very hungry. And then, then God goes back, focuses back onto Jacob to, so that they will finally say, come Lord Jesus. That's why it's called Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. And then God, as we read in Revelation, pours out his wrath upon a world. Now, every time God has done that, when has he done that? Noah and the flood. What happened? He saved the righteous. Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened? He pulled out the righteous. When the wrath of God comes upon the world, what does he do? He pulls out the righteous. You see, God doesn't beat up his bride during the seven years and say, oh, well, let's get, let's get married. And also, Jesus took the wrath, the penalty for us. And so there'll be the rapture of the church, there'll be seven years tribulation, uh, of which there will be a massive revival, people will come to know Jesus. That's why it's called, uh, after Revelation 6, you never hear about the church, what you hear about is tribulation saints, those that have become Christians during that period. And then after that, Jesus will come down with the church, there'll be the battle of Armageddon, and then there's going to be the establishment of his millennial kingdom where we will rule and reign with Christ, okay? Okay. I hope that's helpful. And so what, what, so what Jesus is saying is that bit isn't yet. I'm going to do the other bit right now. I'm going to do the other bit right now. And that's why it says this. And so as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear. So he's telling this parable to say, listen, I know you think that I'm about to establish my kingdom, but that's not what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen right now. That's the point of this parable. Are you, are you with me? So he said, therefore, in verse 2, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. That's what Jesus has gone and done. God, this is the, the, the point at which Jesus has gone to be established and he will come back and return as king. And... This is actually what happened. Like this analogy would have been um, obvious to the Jews when he said it because what happened with, with, with uh, Israel at the time, they had a, a puppet or a vassal king under the Roman Empire. And so what would happen is we had what King Herod the Great, 
his son Achilles, all of those guys would have had to have gone off to Rome and said, I'm off to, be, to become king. I'll come back in my return. And so the noblemen would go to the emperor. The emperor would declare them king. They would go back and return and establish their kingdom. So the Jews absolutely knew what Jesus was saying here as an analogy. And so what I want to point out here is we have the here and not yet of the kingdom. It's been inaugurated by Christ on the cross, but it won't be consummated until he returns. So we're in the here and not yet. Now, oftentimes we use the here and not yet as a reason why we don't always see healings, right? Well, because his kingdom is breaking in, and therefore that's why we don't always see healings. And I'm not saying that's incorrect, but that's not the only reason we should be aware of the here and not yet. And this parable tells us what our part to play is in the here and not yet of his kingdom. What do we do when we are waiting for the king to return? And that's the second point I want to look at, which is our role in the waiting. What do we do? Do you have a party and go, hey, the nobleman's gone. Let's have some fun. No, this is not what Jesus is saying. He says in uh, verse 13, calling 10 of his servants. servants, he gave them 10 minors and said to them, engage in business until what? I come, until I come. So he's giving them and us instructions. Say, listen, I'm off now, but I'm coming back. And during the here and not yet, I've got something for you to do. Now, this is for you and me. What is it? Let's look at the miners first. A miner is about 100 drachmas. You say, well, that's not very helpful, Mark. I don't know how much a drachma is worth. Fair point. 100 drachmas is about 100 days' wages. Now, I Googled, or whatever your search engine preference would be. That's uh, not a, an advertisement for Google. They don't need it, obviously. Um, the, <laughs> the average salary in the UK is 35,000 pounds. Now, for some of you, that's a lot. For some of you, not so much, but that's the average. So I did some, uh, some work on this. It wasn't that difficult. I divided 35 by 100. And it's roughly about 10,000 pounds for 100 days. I rounded it up to the nearest 1,000, okay? So, so therefore, one miner is 10,000 pounds. How many miners did he give them? It's not a trick question. How many miners did he give them? 10. 10 times 10 is what? Exactly. That's a lot of money. 100,000. It's like, I'm going to give you 100,000 pounds. Way, I've won the lottery. Come on. Right, let me get my list of things that I needed to purchase. Sports car, tick. Hmm. Holiday tick. None of, none of that is wrong. Right? Don't feel condemned if you've just bought a sports car. May the Lord bless you in that. Um, so it's a lot of money, and I think this is beautiful because I think it speaks to the, the abundance and generosity of our Lord. Like, he didn't go, I'm going to leave you with a tenner. Let's see what you do with that. He leaves us with 100,000 pounds each. Not literally, of course. But the point here is that it's more than just money. Like, this represents our time, energy, and indeed our money. And what's very critical about this is that God is the owner of the miners and gave it to the, what, stewards? What does that mean? Everything you have, and that's the thread that I've picked out of last week, everything that you have is not yours, right? It's not yours. And that goes against the grain, doesn't it? It goes, like, even as I say it, I'm like, ooh, that just feels wrong. But it's truth. The world pushes a narrative of accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. It's yours, yours, yours. You deserve it. Your three favorite friends, me, myself, and I, we deserve the money. But you see, we're the here, not yet. And so the truth is, God has given us something to steward. And that means we are to invest it for the king. That's why I want to say it's more than just giving your tithe. Like that, <clears throat> God does that and instructs us to do it, to break the power of money in our lives. Like that's a starting point. But if we go, I'm a tither, you've missed the point. Because more fundamentally than that, in the here and not yet of the kingdom, everything that we have is from God and he has given us specific instructions on how we are to steward the money he has given us. Are you with me? Give me an amen if you're, in the, if you're with me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So we are to do the king's bidding in the king's business. Because you all know that you've been uh, signed up by the king. 
And we have in this moment a choice to make. It really does come down to, with our relationship with money, a question of obedience to God and trust in him. It fundamentally does. It says in the scriptures, you cannot serve to God's money and, and God. You cannot serve. Why does it use the language serve? Because anything you worship other than God, you will be in bondage to and you will serve it. Like what, are the, what are the telltale signs of being in bondage to money? The lie that more money will make you happy, that you don't have enough. The lie that your trust and security comes from your bank balance. The lie that when you give, you feel like you're gonna be poor and have like poverty. Like these are some telltale signs of when you're in bondage to money. <clears throat> I was thinking about this. Like imagine if, because this is challenging. For, I, like, I, I recognize I'm preaching this message and I'm like, I was preparing it this week thinking, Lord, you've got so much work you need to do in my heart here because I don't live like this. Imagine if I looked at my possessions and my house and my car and my money and said, right, Lord, what would you like me to do? I hear that there's someone that needs a car this week. I'll give them my car and I'll find a transport in another way. Imagine what the world would look like if people did that. Like, imagine if I looked at my bank balance every morning and said, well, I really fancy three coffees, but actually, Lord, have you got something else for me? Like, imagine if I lived my life like that. Imagine what the world would look like if we were on the business of the king using our money in that way. Imagine what would happen if everyone tithed. I'll tell you something. We would change the world. I mean, just as a starting point. I mean, this... Jesus was so radical. He's causing us and calling us to live such a radical life of, of obedience and trust, yes, but also joy and experiencing his blessing that if we don't live like this, we won't experience. Now, I was very careful last week to say, listen, you can't take these principles as, as you give, you are blessed and turn it into a formula like a lot of prosperity preachers do and say, well, if you give 10 pounds, you'll get 1,000 next Monday at 12 p.m., like, that's taking a kingdom principle and turning it into a formula. That's how you get into heresy. But there is a kingdom principle that if you give like this and your hands are open, you will receive. For so many of us, we're not receiving in ways that God is really wanting to bless us because we live our lives like this. Okay, I give you my tithe, God. All day, God, I've done it for you. I'm okay, I can, I, I'm good. I was like, but you're missing the point. I've got so much to give to you. Um, thirdly, there will be people who hate the king. This is what else we see here. I mean, the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now, when the Jews heard this, they would have remembered um, King Herod the Great's son, Achilles. The, the Jewish historian Josephus writes that what happened was Achilles got up and said, right, okay, my father's dead. I'm off to Rome. I'll see you later. He didn't use this language, obviously. I shall depart forthwith, off to Rome. And he goes to Rome and they're all like, but we don't want him as king. He's a terrible guy. His dad wasn't much better. And so they actually sent a delegation to Rome to say, you can't make him king. This actually happened. And uh, the emperor heard them and said, well, I don't, I don't know. It probably wasn't the emperor himself. It's probably like, you know, his people. Speak to my people. He said, no, excuse me. He's going to be king. It's a done deal. Listen, we have so many people in this world, and maybe you're here in this room. I don't want Jesus to be my king. I'm sorry, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Like, we have a world that doesn't want Jesus to be king. The whole increase, and I was, I was, I was listening to about it this week, about transhumanism, you know, is, is the... Is, and it's a real threat. People are trying to say, well, I don't need to die. They, they want the blessings of the kingdom, eternal life, without the king. That's what transhumanism is. And I think deep down, they know judgment's coming and they, want, they, they don't want to have to kneel before the king because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is king. But I think even us as Christians sometimes we're like, I don't mind Jesus being king of the areas that I want him to be, but don't be king of my money. If 
Father God, can Jesus not be the king of my money, please? And God's like, it's a done deal. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? I find it a challenge. Because I have to rethink how I think about my relationship with money. And I have to think about my purpose here. Listen, we are here for a moment. Poof. It says in the scriptures like a vapor. But you see, the enemy wants to tell you that this is all it is, that this materialistic, rationalistic worldview will tell you that this is the most important thing. Can I tell you it is not? This is not as real as a supernatural realm and his kingdom. Imagine if we lived our lives thinking we're here for a moment and we were on the king's business and the king was about to return any day. Imagine if Jesus knocked on the door tonight. Hello, good steward. I would like to see what you've done with my miners. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought I had a bit more time. Like, tomorrow is not promised. That's why it said in the scriptures, today is the day of salvation. And Jesus could, that trumpet blast could happen any minute now. Nothing needs to happen before the rapture. It's what they call a signless event. It's called the doctrine of imminence. It could happen in that moment. Why? Because the king has gone to a foreign land, the nobleman, and he's turned king, and he's going to come back, and he's going to rule and reign. And we are those stewards right now. And that leads me to the third point. Our our reward at the end. Let's look at verses 15 to 27. When he returned, this is the nobleman who became king, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants whom he had given money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. At this point, let me pause. This is going to happen. We read about it in Revelation. It is called the beamer seat of Christ. I've talked about it before. The beamer seat, beamer was like a a Greek word that means a a place of reward. They used to have it in the ye old ancient uh, Olympics where the, the, the people that ran the race would go to the beamer seat and receive their rewards. Now, the, the truth is, the absolute truth is, you cannot earn your salvation. This is not about salvation. We are saved by grace, not by works, lest any man or woman should boast. We all, we're all on the same page, right? You cannot earn your way to heaven. If you're here thinking you can be good enough to get to heaven, then you don't understand the good news of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that our works are unimportant. In fact, we will be rewarded for our works here. We will be rewarded. And the doctrine of eternal rewards is something that you can read about in the Bible, that we will have different positions in heaven as we rule and reign with Christ Jesus. In fact, after the thousand years, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and the city of Jerusalem, we will dwell here on a new earth with Christ Jesus. And we will rule and reign with him. Now, you might say, Mark, I'm just happy to get into heaven. I'll be fine. Like, I'm sure we all get the same harps and we probably get the same white cloaks and I'll just be content. Brothers and sisters, listen. We're here for a moment and God's got business for you in heaven. You're not just going to be lying there going, this is really boring. Oh, I've sung that chorus five times now. You're not going to think that. I mean, there's going to be amazing worship around the throne of God. But we're going to be busy, ruling and reigning. And when Jesus, when the parable talks about cities to rule, that is what's going to happen. What do you think we're going to be doing in our resurrected bodies in the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years? When people come through the tribulation, they will be in their earthly bodies and we'll be with, with Christ in our resurrected bodies, ruling and reigning. And I don't know about you, but I kind of, I like that idea. I want to be busy. I want, I want lots to do. It's not a bad thing to be motivated by blessing. I I motivate my children with a few things. Number one is a healthy fear of mummy and daddy. Don't you be rude. Number two is a healthy appreciation that if they they do good, that we reward them and bless them. So that works for us. And you go, oh, Mark, I'm too holy to worry about Jesus blessing me. Me just getting through my life is blessing enough. Thank you very much. Don't limit God's heart to bless you. Are you hearing me, church? Do I get a witness in the room? Thank you. Where was I? Stick to the notes, Mark. Stick to the notes. Um, But the truth is, when he comes, he will reward us at the beam of seat of Christ. And I personally, and I won't speak for you, I want to say, you know what? Everything you gave me, Lord, I tried my best. 
I did this for the kingdom and this, and I saw profit. I saw souls saved. I saw hospitality in a way in which people never experienced before. I want to be able to have that conversation, and I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Are you living your life with an eternal perspective and with Jesus in view that's about to come back? Or are you looking at your life like this with the stuff around you where rust and moth will destroy, but where the treasures in heaven, rust and moth will not destroy? This is such a radical kingdom living message, isn't it? About how we are to look at the the, the resources that God has given us But there is the bad, isn't there, in this story? We've got the good, the rewards, but there is the bad. Then the other came saying, Lord, here is your miner which I kept laid away in your handkerchief for I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. In other words, I had a false view of you. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own, you know, if if those are the words you want to use, then I'll judge you by those words. Like, you rejected me, that's fine. And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has 10 miners. And they said, Lord, he has already has 10 miners. Well, I'm looking at faithfulness, not how much he has. And he was faithful, so give it to him. I tell you that everyone who has more, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now listen to this. But as for these enemies of mine, like we are in a spiritual battle and Christ has enemies who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. Like, why is the gospel so good news? Because the bad news is so utterly bad. You know, what is it about these liberal, oh, let me not start, Lord Jesus. I've got six minutes to go. You know, I'm going to say it anyway. What is it about these liberal preachers that have decided to tell everyone there's no hell? What is it about these liberal preachers that say, listen, this is, well, it's what you make it. Pick the bits that work for you. Like, all you're doing is you're, the, the question has to eventually come, so excuse me, part of preacher, uh, if God is love all the time and he, he loves everything I do, and if there's no hell, and uh, yeah, uh, why did Jesus die on the cross exactly? That's, that's where it gets you. So why is the good news good news? Because I don't think it's very bad at the moment. You're telling me I can do what I want. The good news is good news because the bad news is terrible. That every knee will confess and there will be a second death, it's called. In other words, if you're born twice in the flesh and by the spirit, you only die once. If you're born once, I own in the flesh, you die twice. This is serious business. You know, your neighbor that you get on really well with needs to go to Alpha because the bad news is really bad. But the good news is amazing because Jesus said, well, that slaughter and that wrath of God, because he's a holy God, I'm going to take on their behalf. That's the good news. That's the gospel, right? We know it. Like, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by the blood of Jesus that was shed on our behalf so that the wrath of God that was going to be to us as sinners is pointed to Jesus. And the righteousness of Jesus is given unto us. That is wonderful news. I mean, amazing news. I love this parable because it says so much, doesn't it? It talks about where we are at now, the here and not yet. It gives us hope and confidence that Jesus will return. That's good news, right? He will come back. He will establish his kingdom. It tells us what we are to do while we're here. Like, I've got no idea what to do. I'm waiting on a specific word from the Lord. Read your Bible first. There's enough there to get you going. Now, as charismatics, we, we oftentimes just wait around until we get the letter from God or the phone call from him, you know. But just read your word. Like, he's given us resources. Whatever it is for you, say, so go, go, go make a profit for my kingdom. Go use that for my kingdom purposes. Like that should be something that when we walk out these doors, we look at our day and our coming week very, very differently. And we look at our finances very differently. And we look at our possessions very differently. What else does it tell us? That there are those that hate the king. And our job is to say, listen, don't hate the king. You've got to love the king because of what he's done for you. Like this is a, an imperative to share the gospel 
Because while it is true that you and I are going to be rewarded, those of you here who are Christians, the truth is there are those that will go to the white throne of judgment, not the beamer seat of Christ, and they will be judged. And they will come up short. I don't know about you, but I don't want my friends and family to be in that place. The time is short. The clock is ticking. If, as I said in the New Testament, we're in the final hour, what do you think this is? It's the final seconds of the church age, of the here and not yet. Church, with that, I'd like you to stand. 